and go to Jesus. He will embrace me in his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior. Good evening. The thing with the Bible that is very, very great is it is so consistent from beginning to end. Tonight we want to start with Psalm 23. And again, when we read this, we're going to be looking at 1 Peter. And when we read this, think about what Peter's telling us and think about Psalm 23. He tells us in Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As a Christian, our hope, our faith is all in Jesus. And knowing that Jesus is our shepherd, we know that with Jesus we will have no wants. When we stay true to Jesus, he will stay true to us. When we look at Peter, the Apostle Peter, we know that Peter was with Jesus from the beginning. We know Peter had many hard times with Jesus sometimes, and there were sometimes you could see there were some disagreements. But Peter became a strong apostle, and he preached the word very boldly, and he gives us a good insight of how we should be living as a Christian. Peter wrote us a letter. He wrote this letter to us today, and when we go to 1 Peter, Chapter 1, he tells us, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Capitus, Asia, and Bethany. When we look at this here, think about what he's telling you. He is a, an apostle. There's no apostles today, but he was handpicked by Jesus to be an apostle. He was handpicked by Jesus to be one of the trusted ones, one of the ones who helped through the Holy Ghost, write the Bible and tell us today what it is we need to know. He's talking about those who were scattered, the Christians that were scattered. We know from the book of Acts that Paul, who was Saul at the time, was scattering the people all around. Now when you stop and think about it, who calls all these people, the Christians, to be scattered abroad? It was the work of the devil. See, the devil thought, okay, I'm going to get rid of the Lord's church early in life. I'm going to scatter them people out and it'll be over. Well, thank you, devil. You made it so they went throughout the whole world and they preached the gospel to everyone. You helped spread the gospel message. You see, this is a great thing about Jesus and Jesus' message. And they knew this and they went and scattered, but yet they stayed true. They stayed true to the Lord Jesus. He says, elected according to the foreknowledge of God, the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, Grace unto you, and peace be multiplied. You see, here we are, because at the foundation of the world, God had a plan. He had a plan to save us. And we know that through the blood of Christ, because when we are born again, we come up a new creature in Christ. And it's because of the blood of Christ that we have the grace of God. And we have peace, peace with God through the blood of Jesus. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy had begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Think about those words. We have a lively hope. We have a lively hope because of Jesus. Jesus died for our sins, and Jesus was resurrected on that third day. And that means that God accepted Jesus as payment in full for our sins. We have a lively hope because our Lord and our Savior went to that cross willingly to be the sacrifice for our sin. And when on that third day he arose, he arose from the grave, that means that God accepted him as payment in full for my sins and your sins. 
We have a lively hope. We have this hope because those who trust and obey Jesus, those who follow those commands, those who are born again, who are born again of the water and of the spirit, they come out of that watery grave because we go into that watery grave, we go into that grave and come up a new creature in Christ, a new man in Christ. And that's what gives us our lively hope, the blood of Christ, his mercy. We have a savior. And because of Jesus, we can look forward to a what? We can look forward to a mansion in the sky with God the Father, Jesus our Savior, and the Holy Ghost who's our comforter. A lively hope. Jesus is alive and well waiting to meet you. Did you ever stop and think about that? He's waiting to meet you. We have a lively hope. Those who obey and trust Jesus. And we have this lively hope that we were baptized into his death. And because we were baptized into his death, we come up a new creature and we are covered in the blood, the blood of Christ. And it is the blood that carries us through. Think of this, a lively hope. All these other people don't have a lively hope. They worship false things. That's why you don't worship things on this earth. We are just passing through. We know this place is not our home, that we're just passing through. And one day we will be in heaven. And he tells us in verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. An inheritance. Think about this. We, because we are a child of God, because we come up a new creature in Christ, we are part of the inheritance. When you look in Romans chapter 8, if you turn there with me, please. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> And we look at verse 14. I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 14. Um, he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. What is the Spirit of God? It is the Holy Ghost. Peter's not mincing words. He tells us on the first day of the opening of the church, the day of Pentecost, that one is to be immersed, one is to be baptized, and when you are baptized, you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So because we are led by the Holy Ghost, we are the sons of God. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. This is one of the greatest things that we have. We have a lively hope. We worship a living God. God, we worship Jesus who is a living God. He's on the right hand side of the Father. The Father and it's because of him that we have what we have. And we not only have the blood of Christ, but we are now known as the children of God. We're not just a creation anymore. We're a child of God. And if we stay true to God all the way through, we become part of the inheritance. When we read verse 5, it says, Who are kept by the power of God through faith and the salvation, ready to be revealed in the last times. <clears throat> Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations. The trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish through it be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen ye love and whom though now ye see him not yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full glory. Receiving the end of your faith even the salvation of your soul. Think about those words. These words here, when we look at them, we know that we see here the faith that we have in Jesus and that we have faith, as it tells us in Hebrews. When we look at Hebrews, verse 11, and chapter 11, I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, <clears throat> starting with verse 1 and 3. He tells us, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. 
Through faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. And then it goes on and tells us about all the examples of faith throughout the history of the world. It tells us about the faith of all those who are in the Old Testament, who had faith in God, even though they didn't have the promise. But see, we know that we live by faith, and that is what makes us so good because we understand that this is the Word of God. We have faith in Jesus, even though we don't see Jesus eye to eye. We know Jesus from reading his Bible. That's one reason why we study, to show thyself approved, so that we can know who Jesus is and understand his ways. When we look at verse uh, 39... To sum it all up in Hebrews 11, it says, And all these things, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. See, all those that they talk about in verse 4 through 38 were the Old Testament. And they obtained a great report, a good report. The Bible talks good about them. But they did not receive the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. You see, we live strictly by faith. They had sight, they had faith, but we have faith. We do not live by sight. We know that Jesus is the Christ. We know that Jesus is the Son of God. We know Jesus went to that cross willingly. We know that Jesus not only went to that cross willingly, he could have left that cross at any time. He could have called down a legion of angels at any time and left that cross, and he would have been justified in doing so. We know that Jesus loves us so much that he did this. He loved us today. He went to that cross for us today. And that's what we need to make sure we understand. That he went to that cross for us today. And that we know that through Jesus we can have life everlasting in heaven. That is the great thing about Jesus. When we look at verse 10, it says... Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesies of the grace that should come unto you. Okay? Searching what or searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. When we see this, he's talking about the power, the gospel, the power of God. When we look at Romans chapter 1, if you turn there, Romans chapter 1, it is very clear in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, not believe, believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You see, here we are talking about, Peter's talking about the same thing that all the apostles talked about. Salvation. The prophets knew of the salvation that was coming. They searched diligently. And the grace that come unto us through the power of the gospel of Christ. Searching. When we search it out in the Old Testament, we see they were talking about the coming of the Christ. The Old Testament testifies of the coming of the Christ. It also testifies of the fact that we, as Gentiles, were also going to be part of the fold. You see, that was part of God's unfolding plan. That we were going to be part of the fold. And the Holy Ghost came down, and Peter's talking about on the day of Pentecost, when the twelve were together, and they were preaching, the Holy Ghost came down upon them, and they preached, and they spake their own language, but everyone there heard it in their own tongue. And that was the first miracle of the new church as they were preaching. And the people started seeing that there was something going on here. And 3,000 souls were saved that day. 3,000 souls came to Jesus because they preached Jesus crucified. When we look at this 
the early days of the church, and we see the power of the Holy Ghost, and we see the power of the apostles, and we see the might of God. It makes us understand that God is in control of all things. When we look at the early days of the church, we realize that the early days of the church were prophesied before by the prophets. And this is what Peter's talking about, the same thing Paul talks about, the same thing they all talk about. We know that Peter also saw the Gentiles come into the fold. Peter preached the first gospel message to the Gentiles, to Cornelius. And we know that while he was preaching, the Holy Ghost fell upon him. Only twice we see that. Once on the apostles, once on the Gentiles, so that the apostles knew they were now part of the fold. They were now part of God's plan. And that is so great for us today because we're the Gentiles. We got to come into God's plan. We were invited into the church. <clears throat> when we read verse 13, it says, Wherefore, grit, grit up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> You know, you don't have to drink alcohol to be drunk. You start reading some of these self-help books, you start reading some of these crazy liberal books, you might get hung up and become drunken on something that's not of God. You might become drunken on a false doctrine. You might fall yourself away. There's more ways than one you can be drunk in the eyes of God. And you need to think about that. That's why it's so very careful not to be tempted. Stay away from temptation. The devil's very good. You know, people, they don't give the devil his dues. The devil is very good. Look at what he did to Peter. Look what he did to the apostles. He calls all the apostles to abandon Jesus on his night that he was betrayed. Now, they came back. They got presence of mind to come back, but one didn't. Always keep that in mind. Judas was with Jesus for three years. He slept with Jesus. He ate with Jesus. Judas had the power. And the devil was able to convince him that he couldn't go back. He says, as obedient children, not fashion yourself according to the former lust in your ignorance. We came to Christ. We repented. We turned away from our old way of life. We came a new creature in Christ. We accepted Jesus Christ. We went under that water. When we went under that water, we received the gift of the Holy Ghost. We come up a new creature in Christ, and we are not to look back. You see, one of the great things is, is that we have to keep in mind is the devil's always toying with our mind. He wants us to look back and say, man, I kind of missed that. I want to go back there. Then he gets you off track. What does Jesus tell us very plainly in Matthew? There is a straight and narrow path that leads to heaven, but the road to destruction, the road to hell is wide and broad. This is why you have to stay focused. This is why you need to be careful. What is in this world is worth losing your soul over? What in this world would you trade your soul for? And that is what you always have to keep in mind. Do you want to be obedient children? You won't want to go after the things that you were corrupted of before. Remember, we were against God before we came in the blood of Christ. Why would you want to go back to the things that put you in, in an alien with God? <clears throat> but as he which had called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father without respect of person, judges according to every man's work, passes the time of your sojourning here in fear. We need to be holy, but we know we're going to fall real short. We're going to fall short, and the Lord knows this. That's why we're covered in the blood. But we strive to be holy. We strive to do what's right. We strive not to sin. But we have... An advocate with the Father, Jesus. We have the covering of the blood of Jesus. When we sin, we go to prayer. We ask for re forgiveness. We repent. And the blood covers us. But we have to repent. We have to keep this in mind. We have to strive to be holy. So if you are looking at something that you know God would not approve of, stay away from it. See, that's why we have the comforter. That's why we have the Holy Ghost. 
That is what makes us a living hope. The living hope is the comforter in us, the Holy Ghost. And he's warning us, he's helping us to get through this life so that we can get out on the other side alive. You see, you know, everyone's born and die. The next thing is, are you born or do you die twice? See, I'd rather be born twice than die twice. <clears throat> he tells us, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. Okay? But with the precious blood of Christ, with the precious blood of Christ, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Think about that. So many people think they can buy their way into heaven. So many people today, it is very, very telling. When I see different people who know nothing about God, certain celebrities, certain business people, certain people that everybody looks up to, they think they're going to give all their fortunes away when they die. They're not going to do it while they're alive. Mind you, they're going to do it after they're dead. Set up all these trusts. They're going to monument their self because there'll be trust in their names. So every time something's done, it'll bring up their name. And this is what the good they did. God's not a respecter of persons. God is a respecter of Jesus Christ, his son. And he looks for those who have the blood of Christ. He don't look for how much gold and silver you have. You know what? It's his anyway. That's what we need to understand. It's his anyway. And when this world's on fire, what's that gold going to do for you? You know, when Jesus comes back, he's not looking for how much gold you have. He's looking for the covering of the blood. That's what we need to get across to people. We need to understand that it's the precious blood of Christ. The precious blood of Christ. You know, I don't think we say it enough. Jesus Christ came to this world. He lived in this world. He put up with all the stuff in this world and he never sinned. He never sinned. He never went against God the Father. And he went to that cross willingly for our sins. The one who had no sins died for our sins. That's how much he loved us. You know, Peter said, Lord, Lord, I love you. I'll die for you. And then he kind of backed out, didn't he? You see, man, we don't have the love for Jesus he has for us. And, and I don't know how to explain this, but the more I remember what Larry used to teach me about agape love, and the more I read the Bible, I realize I don't have the love for Jesus he has for me. Jesus had an unconditional love. He went to that cross knowing not whether I would follow him or not. He didn't know if I'd become a Christian, but he died, so I had that chance. I don't think I'd do that for somebody. I usually want pretty much 100% guarantee. Now, I'm just being honest with you. You see, Jesus' love is so great. It is so great. And we need to understand he loves us so much, he nuts none of us to perish. But we have to obey. We have to trust and obey. And there are commands of Christ. And we need to make sure that we are doing them. And it is so important. It is so important because we know not when he's coming back. He says in verse 20, Who verily was ordained before the foundations of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead, and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God. Jesus came to this world. So that we understood who God the Father really is. He came to this world so we understood what we have to do in order to please God the Father so that we could be in heaven. He came to this world and gave us the written words of life so that we can study them ourselves. We don't have to rely on someone telling us what to do because that's what happens all throughout history. People rely on someone who changes the words around a little bit. And when they change the words around a little bit, next thing you know, you're on the wrong path and you don't know it because you don't study the Bible. Jesus came to this world to make sure that we could find God. 
He says, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto unfringed love of the brethren, we, <clears throat> brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart frequently. Purifying your soul and obeying the truth. When one becomes a new creature in Christ, when one says, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and they know they're going to repent from their sins, they know they are living in sin, and they go into that watery grave, they go underneath that water, they are purifying their soul coming up, cleansed in the blood of Christ. You purified your soul. And we need to make sure that we stay in that love of Jesus. And we need to make sure that we also love our brethren. We love our brethren as much as we love ourselves. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So many people say, you don't have to be born again. But yet, that's their words, and it will not live forever. You see, we are born again. And we're not of the corruptible seed. So guess what? That water of the woman's womb that you came out of, that's not the water he's talking about. He's talking about when you go underneath that water and you go underneath that water and you then come in contact with the blood and you come up a new creature in Christ and then you have the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then you were born of the non-corruptible seed. The seed of the woman is corruptible. It's part of the flesh. We need to understand, again... That we are part of the Lord's. We are part of the uncorruptible seed. And that will live, liveth, which means forever and ever, and abideth forever and ever. Because Peter lets us know. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass wither, and the flower therefore falleth away. All this great doctrine that man has written over the years, pulling men away from Christ, all these people who follow these great doctrines, these great wise words as they call them, they're not going to last. They're going to fall away. When you leave this earth, you'll find out, uh-oh, I went the wrong way. Too late, folks. Why Jesus came to this earth? There's one foundation. There's one Lord. There's only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus came to this earth. So don't be fooled with the things that are going to wither away. We want to be what he tells us in verse 25. The word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. The word of the Lord, the Bible, the written word of God. Do not add to, do not take away from. For this is the whole meaning of God. When we look at Romans chapter 3, if you turn there with me. Again, it is so great to see how it is so consistent from beginning to end. And there's so much more in here than we're even going to touch on tonight. But when we go to Romans chapter 3, <clears throat> starting with verse 21, he tells us, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifest being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Okay? Again, he's talking about the righteousness of God, the same thing the prophets were talking about, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a proposition through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God, to declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness that he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. <clears throat> Where is the boasting then? It is excluded by what law of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Jesus came here to free us from death and sin. The law could not save us. 
The blood of Jesus saves us. It is something that we need to understand. Just as we read about in Psalms 23, the Lord is my shepherd, and as Jesus is my shepherd, I shall not want. He will provide everything for me. Amen? When we look at this world, we need to understand that there is only one. One Savior, there is only one God, there is only one baptism, there is only one way. And as they tell us in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verse 13, sums it all up. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. We are to fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. And these are words we need to really understand. God shall bring every work. I know people say we don't have works, but all through the Bible it says God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Amen? Amen. Tonight, if you're outside of Christ, what's keeping you outside of Christ? Jesus came to this world. He's given you an opportunity to share in his inheritance. How many in this room would open your inheritance to everybody else in this room? Yeah, that ain't going to happen, is it? But Jesus came to this world, and Jesus has a lot more to offer than anyone in this room. He offers you the inheritance. He offers you a place in heaven to live with him forever and ever. It's not just like on a weekend or a couple weeks out of the year. It's forever and ever. What's holding you back? You know, all you have to do is understand you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and you repent saying, I know I've sinned. I know that I'm not going back that way. I want to follow you, Jesus. I want to be your servant. I want to be your disciple. And then you go underneath that water. And when you're underneath that water, God's miracle puts the blood of Jesus on you and you come up a new creature in Christ and you have the indwelling of the Holy Ghost, the lively hope, the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. And you are now alive, alive unto God. And if you have repented and come to Christ, what's holding you back if you've fallen away? You know, we fall away and the devil says, oh no, you can't go back. He did that to 12 apostles. 11 went back and one chose not to. Don't be like the one. Look at what happened that night. Be in Jesus. Accept Jesus. Make sure you understand that Jesus, as long as you're living, as long as your heart's beating, he's giving you the opportunity to come back to the fold. Repent and come back. Amen. I will arise and go to Jesus. He will embrace me. In his arms, in the arms of Christ my Savior.